Thank you all very much for coming. Um, we might make a start. I should first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ed Santo. I'm uh, the Human Rights Commissioner here at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, I still feel uh, like I'm relatively new in the job, but I think now that the COP has moved on to 2017, I'm not really entitled to say that anymore. Uh, in, a, in a moment, I'll tell you a little bit um, more about the panelists um, and uh, some of the focus for um, this afternoon's event. But uh, most importantly, I should um, now introduce Auntie Norma Ingram to give uh, the welcome to country. Uh, Auntie Norma is a great friend of the Human Rights Commission, and so we are very grateful to have you here with us again. Uh, Auntie Norma is a Wiradjuri um, woman who was born in Cowra and has lived most of her life uh, in Redfern um, in the city, Sydney. Uh, Norma has a Master's of Education from Harvard University and has, if I may say this, many decades experience in education, training and serving Aboriginal communities. Thank you, Thank you. Ed's a little taller than I am. I'm sorry, I hate having this in between us, but I'll enjoy it. Um, the Dada Gomorra, uh, which is hello in the local Aboriginal language. It is my absolute privilege to be here with you this evening and, and to do the, the thousands and thousands of years protocol, and that is welcome to country. So, um, as Ed said, I am a Wiradjuri woman, so Yamadun Rang Yamadun Nong Ingram, Wiradjuri Gina, and my totem is the Gawana, and I'm fresh water. So, I've just said to you hello in, uh, in my language, Wiradjuri which is my mother's mother's traditional language and I can trace my heritage right back to the dream time through my mother. And my father's also Aboriginal as well, a little bit of Scottish there. So I'd like you to do something just before we start. I'd like you to turn to somebody else you haven't seen or spoken to and say, Yama. Yama. <laughs> which is just hello. So you've just said an Aboriginal word, um, and most Aboriginal people will recognise that if you say Yama. And the reason I do that is because, you know, there's lots and lots of um, people out there. We have so many people who are living on the streets now, um, and nobody says hello to them. And, and I think we need to be aware of that. Um, so that's what Welcome to Country is all about. It's about acknowledgement. It's about acknowledging others, but very, more importantly, it's about acknowledging Mother Earth and our culture. We, as Aboriginal people, um, Torres Strait Islander people, have a responsibility to look after the earth, to look after the seas, to look after the waterways. As I said, I'm fresh water, but here where we are tonight, we are on the traditional land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So right across this land, we've got over 200 different um, nations, Aboriginal nations or language groups. We don't have tribes, as people say. It's mainly language groups is what we call it. Um, and so right across is about 200. So where we are now is on Eora country. Eora country is bounded by three rivers, the Hawkesbury River, the Georges River, the Nepean River out west. And so they're natural boundaries. And so you'll find that wherever you go across this, um, this ancient land, um, the language groups will be bounded by natural features. And so here, um, there are 29 smaller clan groups as part of the Eora Nation. So we're so privileged that we are able to work, play and live on Gadigal land. And the Gadigal indeed looked after the land um, for thousands and thousands of generations. Unfortunately, when the tall ships came in, many of the Gadigal people um, died in a very short time because we didn't have any of those. Um, we weren't immune to some of the diseases like the common common cold. So when they got pneumonia, they, the Gadigal people died. So there are remaining Gadigal people. Um, but I'm just so fortunate that I've lived on Gadigal land most of my life and, and had my children and raised my children. I'm the chairperson of the Wayanga Aboriginal um, Elders Program in Redfern. So I love being able to go out and meet people. So Welcome to Country is, is about, as I said, acknowledging, paying respect to Mother Earth. So we do that in a number of different ways. We do our dances, we do our songs, we do our art, and we do our prayers, and, and um, our God is the army. Um, and so, so many of our people do respect other um, deities as well. So 
you know, this this is a really good thing that we I think in this country that there's so many um, mixtures of cultures and languages, and I love it. And I love what people have been brought with them um, since the talk ships came in and, and a little bit before. They brought these other languages in the culture, which which is the tapestry of what we see today as as Australia. But I always say, um, you know, that we have to look at, at the vulnerable people and how our governments and our country treats vulnerable people. You know, I said about people sleeping on the streets. I'm being a little bit political, but I don't think we should have people sleeping on the streets. I think our country should be able to look after that. And so Welcome to Country is also about um, acknowledging who we are, where we are. Um, there are three R's that I, um, I always talk about. Respect, that's respecting the culture and respecting the people, respecting Mother Earth. Responsibility, we do have a responsibility as Aboriginal people, but certainly all as, as Australians has a responsi um, responsibility. And the third one is reciprocity, which I think is lovely because it's about us looking after each other. And so when we do that, um, then we're paying our respect and then we're showing responsibility. Acknowledgement of country and welcome to country is also about letting Mother Earth know that we are here to protect her, that we look after her, because if we don't do that, um, there's another R, there'll be repercussions for that. And we can see that, for example, at the Great Barrier Reef, we're now, um, you know, we're, we're losing so much of the Great Barrier Reef, but we need to, um, we need to make sure that we're all okay and we're looking after land. So that's what Welcome to Country is all about. So wherever you've come from, I welcome you to Gadigal land. It's also important for us to acknowledge elders, Aboriginal elders most certainly, but elders from other cultures and other countries as well. And we do have a responsibility as elders to teach others. Um, this is my big responsibility this evening as an elder, is to, is to share with you uh, my culture. But we also have a responsibility to teach the next generation, the younger ones. Um, they're our future. The next generation, the young ones are our future. So we do have a big responsibility to make sure that, that they are okay as well. But we do have a responsibility that our elders are okay. And indeed, everybody is okay. So that's why we say yama. Um, so I just wish you all a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, we know that there are lots of vulnerable groups there. So let's look out, out for each other. You know, let, let's embrace each other in a really positive way. I don't mean big hugs, you can do that if you want to, but embrace each other. We are all human beings after all. Um, so wherever you come from this evening, whether you come from close, um, next suburb, another state, or from overseas, I bid you welcome. Welcome to Aboriginal land, welcome to Gadigal land, and as we always say, it always was, it always is, and it always will be Aboriginal land. And it's right there under the tar and sneak. You lift that up and uh, the land is still there. And she'll be there a lot long, uh, for a long, long time after we have gone. So congratulations for your evening. Uh, have a great time here with, with everybody. And uh, welcome to Aboriginal land. Thank you. very much, Auntie Norma, for that really warm welcome to the country. And uh, to everyone here, welcome again, Yadama again. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge on behalf of all of us here, um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, the elders both past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the uh, elders from the LGBTI community uh, that are represented here, and especially a number of 78ers who hold rightly a special place in our hearts. I'd like to um, welcome all of you uh, who are either friends of the Commission or at least curious about the Commission. Either way, you're very, very welcome here and I particularly pay tribute to a number of my colleagues who um, have been central to making this event happen. Um, a couple of housekeeping things I should get out of the way really quickly. Uh, for those of you who are wanting to tweet, Go ahead, be our guests. Um, if you want to use a um, hashtag, the one that we would encourage is hashtag Bright's Talk, or one word, obviously. Um, 
the uh, facilities are to your left, and there are some people who will be able to help you um, locate them. And um, finally, we are taking uh, photographs um, and we are live streaming the event. Um, if for any reason you do not wish to be um, photographed, perhaps you could either um, identify yourself now by putting your hand up or um, identify yourself uh, separately to my colleague, um, Dom O'Grady, who's um, standing over there and is waving for everyone. Um, if you wish, wish to take photos, feel free to do so of the speakers, but we generally ask you to take photos this way rather than um, of the audience. Uh, we at the Human Rights Commission are delighted and indeed we're honoured to be part of the Mardi Gras program. Um, we've been involved in many Mardi Gras events uh, over the years, um, including uh, marching um, and we will be marching at this year's event. Uh, we see that the uh, Mardi Gras has continued very important relevance um, in 2017 uh, in promoting diversity and inclusion. Those principles are as important now as they were the very first March. The Commission's work on sexual orientation, gender identity and intersex rights issues uh, runs deep. Um, as Human Rights Commission, as Human Rights Commissioner, um, it's a central part of my own work, but we're also very aligned to the intersectional nature of LGBTI human rights issues, and as a result, it's a really important feature of the work of every single commissioner and Julian Triggs as president. Just to give you a little flavour, since 2013, uh, as many of you would be aware, our federal law protects against discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status, and that was uh, that those changes were a very important part of our work. Um, we employ a specialist LGBTI advisor at the risk of incurring her broth, we'll name her, her name is Laura Sweeney. Many, many of you will be aware of her work. She is a, a, a true powerhouse of expertise within the commission. Um, we've done a number of uh, pieces of work that some of you will be familiar with, but perhaps you could give me the opportunity to advertise the work of some of my colleagues. Um, particularly uh, my uh, predecessor, Tim Wilson's Resilient Individuals Report, um, for that the same sex, same entitlements report, the sex files report, and most recently the Commission's submission on uh, the marriage equality bill, the most recent marriage equality bill. This afternoon's theme is the role of law in protecting sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex rights. Uh, the the key word there might be the word law. Um, and uh, I guess part of the reason in choosing that might be my own bias. I am a lawyer, which is usually the three words that, four words that you use immediately before sending someone to sleep. Um, but, but stay awake because we have some fantastic speakers and I promise you I'm more than halfway through. I'm going to be great. For us, in choosing that theme, we wanted to focus on the law because the law is most obviously a set of rules and a, a very important set of rules in any liberal democracy, but it's also important for another re reason. The law has an educative uh, dimension. It, it, is, it is there to help people understand what our government, our, our elected representatives, believes uh, constitute acceptable and unacceptable behaviour. Now that's true of all of our legal regulation, but it's especially important in the area of human rights. And that's because it's better for people to understand and ideally internalise what it means to treat people with dignity and fairly and in a just way, rather than picking up the pieces when something goes wrong. Our human rights laws, and specifically our anti-discrimination laws, are vital, of vital importance. But, as many of you perhaps know all too well, when your human rights are violated, there is some important work for the law to do to redress that, but there's only so much that the law can do to fix a problem such as a violation of human rights. So what we want to do is have the law operate as a beacon, as a statement that is really clear for the community 
as to what constitutes acceptable behaviour and how we should treat each other with dignity. So um, this, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to invite one by one each of the panel members to address all of you um, briefly, just, uh, just over five minutes. I suspect each person will speak for. Um, then we'll have um, some questions and answers. And I'll start by asking a few questions, and you can work up some questions um, as I'm doing that. And we'll have, hopefully, plenty of time to take um, questions from the audience. So um, the last thing I'm going to do before I hand over is um, introduce the speakers. And, and so that you don't have me bobbing up and down, I'm going to introduce them on block um, now. But the first speaker will be uh, Imam Nur Wasami. Um, Nur was born in Somalia and now lives in Melbourne. And he is uh, a Muslim Imam. And he's indeed Australia's first openly gay Muslim spiritual leader and indeed one of the very first in the world. Imam Noor runs Mahaba, a social group that focuses on the welfare of LGBTIQ Muslims in Victoria. Mahaba means welcome in Arabic. And it began in November 2013 to provide a safe, welcoming and confidential space for people to share stories, celebrate their sexuality, and retain their faith and spirituality. Imam Noor has spoken publicly about his personal experience, which is, as many of you would be aware, a very brave, very powerful thing to do. He's celebrated, he speaks at a number of public events, and we feel very fortunate to have him here this afternoon. The next speaker will be Morgan Carpenter, who is an advocate and consultant on body diversity issues and a social and technology policy researcher. Uh, Morgan is among many, many hats that he wears, a co-executive director of National Intersex Organisation at OII Australia, and a consultant to Global Action for Trans Equality Engage. Morgan has played and indeed continues to play a central leadership role systemic advocacy on federal anti-discrimination law and uh, Senate Committee inquiry into voluntary or coerced sterilisation. Morgan participated in the first sex uh, expert meeting held by the UN in 2015 and has moderated a presentation on intersex to the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We also feel very fortunate to have Morgan with us. And then the third speaker is Anna Brown, who has worked with the Human Rights Law Centre since 2011 and leads the Centre's work on LGBTI rights issues. Anna's fingerprints are on nearly every major reform for LGBTI people in recent years, even more so if there is a strategic litigation dimension to it. Uh, she's been involved in leading cases on marriage equality, uh, recognition of sex and gender diversity, uh, securing federal LGBTI discrimination protections, and ongoing work to expunge historical for homosexual offences in a number of states of Australia. And it chairs the Victorian Government's LGBTI Task Force Justice Working Group and is co-chair of Australians for Equality, the National Campaign for Marriage Equality. Anna has won numerous awards. I'm not going to list them all, but I'll mention uh, one of the recent ones, which um, is the Tim McCoy Award in 2015, a, a particularly um, significant one for people who work in the community uh, legal assistance sector because it is chosen by one's peers. So I feel triply uh, fortunate that Anna is also able to join us. So without any further ado, um, I'll now pass on to Imam Nur Wasami who will address us for the Thank you very much, Commissioner. First, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to all the elders, past and present. Um, secondly, I would like to thank the Commissioner for inviting me. I think I was just down the road at um, Pitt Street Church last year around the same time um, when Mark Gross was on. I sat next to Professor Tripp. Um, so I'm quite thankful for having this opportunity to come here today again. Um, 
And one of the things I wanted to first um, share with you about the group. For many years, I was an imam in Melbourne. <clears throat> I started in country Victoria, a place called Bendigo, after September 11 happened in 2001. Now, Bendigo, you would probably have seen some protests that were happening recently about you know, the mosque being built. Same things that were happening 16 years ago when I started uh, are happening now. So I was very young when I started, and um, I lasted about one year there. I couldn't handle the distance. It was the first time I moved out of home. But for all that period, there was a vacuum in the support services for um, LGBTIQ plus Muslims, in particular youth. And I saw this in several mosques that I was um, appointed to be the imam of. Um, so to fill that vacuum in November 2013, as the commissioner mentioned, um, from my humble lounge room, while I had an overweight American bulldog sitting staring at me, and I love Chico passed away now, um, I came up with this idea. Now, one of my teachers when I was studying in South Africa, he used to always ask us before we make any decision to think of a thousand consequences. And he would always make us write them down. And no, none of us even reached a hundred, but it was a good strategy. And he would always make us start with the worst case scenario. Now, when this uh, vision for Mahabha came, I did think carefully of the consequences the ramifications, the threats, not only to me personally, but to even my family, my daughter, etc. And that was something that I was happy to live with. But I wasn't happy to live with the fact that young Muslims who are either LGBTIQ were being traumatized by their own family members. And I've seen this over the years repeated. That I had a problem with. I could accept the risks to me and to my family, even to my daughter. But I wasn't willing to accept it to that 16-year-old that was firstly referred to me in the beginning of November 2013, who was attending an Islamic school. And um, 16 years old, transgender people. And the parents found out that she was researching this stuff online. And the mother sat her down and she said, my, daughter, my darling daughter, she said, if you pray to God with these types of feelings, forget God accepting your prayers. Your prayers, in fact, will be a source of curses to you. 16 years old. That, to me, was emotional and spiritual terrorism put it that way, especially coming from the parents. Now, the numbers are huge around the country, almost on a daily basis, if not on a weekly basis, people are reaching out. Um, it was my intention when I started Mahaba was to provide a safe platform for the youth who come from environments like that to reconcile, number one, their faith, their sexual spirituality with their sexuality. And to use my hat as an imam, that, you know, to tell them, no, you're not a sin, you're not an abomination, you're not a curse, or things that are taught in, I think, majority of religious institutions, but I come from an Islamic background, and I wanted to fill that gap. Thankfully, we have been successful with very um, minimal uh, support from established institutions and governments, and, you know, when you have young people who are attempting self-harm, when you have young people who are um, at risk of addiction, last week, just last week, in a period of five days, from Monday to Friday, I had three cases referred to me, two in Victoria, of a young individual, of young people, and, uh, who attempted self-harm. Two of them were taken to hospital because they are in an environment at home and in their communities that is hostile to even having such discussions. And 
when you do not have emotional literacy, and when you do not have even the courage to uh, reach out for help. So um, the success of this group has been phenomenal, in my opinion. With, in a period of three and a half years, we have um, saved lives. Um, last year, I had my first media appearance on SBS around the same time when Mardi Gras was on. And one of the most, you know, you get both positives and negatives. And um, that's part of the job, I think, as a, a, any person who's in a leadership role. Um, one of the positive things for me was a young um, Somalian boy who called from the US, Minnesota. Interestingly, his name was Onur, like me, my name. He said, had I seen this episode one day late, or had you done this interview one day late, he said, I wouldn't be here. And because he was a pharmacy student, he actually chose the method, the way to do it, and the date. And he said, I wasn't planning to do that. Three and a half years ago, friends, when I started this group, I didn't think this would be the impact that we would have on individuals and on families. Families are reaching out now, and they are saying that we want to have our loved ones back. Another media appearance that happened last year one of the positives that came out of that, all of them were on a voluntary basis. The cameraman was being paid, the interviewee was being paid. I was there on a voluntary basis. Um, because money was never the intention. But one of the positive things out of that one was a Turkish family who had their eldest son estranged from them for eight years. Two boys they had. Um, and the eldest one, 38 years old, when, when the father found out he was in a same-sex relationship, they just cut him off. And to me, it was a bit of a shock because, you know, in our community, my firstborn son and was that pride element. And I asked the mother, they came looking for me at the hospital while I was doing some pastoral care training at Alfred and Alvin. And they came three days in a row looking for me. And they said that we want to have our son back eight years later. So again, when I thought of this, when I had this vision, I didn't think families that have been damaged like that would be bad. So it is truly a very humbling and a, at times very time consuming. Um, but it is something that, you know, if you look back at what I have done as an imam since 2001, and if I compare it to what things that we have accomplished in this group in the last three and a half years, I think what we have accomplished in the last three and a half years outweighs that which I have done. And I was the man of some of the biggest mosques in there. Um, so I would like to finish with um, something that I said down the road here at Pitt Street Church last year, sitting next to Commissioner um, Triggs at the time, Professor Triggs. And that is, you know, each one of us who has a privilege, you know, you're not entitled to this privilege. It is a gift that you are given if you're in a privileged position. And with every privilege comes a great sense of responsibility. Now, you have a huge Muslim community here in Sydney, and a lot of them are young people who are also members of the LGBT. And they do not have such a safe platform. Um, there are new emerging groups and so forth, but something tangible needs to be done. Last year, even though it was a different topic when we were just down the road, it was about asylum seekers. A year on, I think the situation of asylum seekers and refugees has gone much worse. And my hope, my hope, and my prayers uh, that a year later now on this day that we can help improve the situation of LGBTIQ plus Muslim youth and all youth in particular um, with tangible um, solutions because you know we can have all these events but if there is no appropriate uh, legislation like marriage equality 
things like that, then it is all just empty rhetoric. And I was reading today as I was waiting for the flight that was delayed, um, that it is saving lives in the United States. If you read The Guardian today, they wrote an article that the suicide and self-harm rates have dropped by 7%. And research is so showing that it is in direct relation to the, um, the same-sex marriage um, quality that has um, been passed in the US. So youth are suffering, the numbers are increasing, and the fact is, you know, I do a lot of work in different hospitals, there's an avalanche of misery that is coming into psych wards and emergency departments and hospitals because youth do not have that um, environment. At home, especially if they're Muslim, a friend of mine was saying it's very difficult to be Muslim these days. I said to him, it's very difficult to be Muslim, I think, in any time and day, because when you have uh, a religious um, ideology that is based on 7th century, 8th century, you will never improve. You will always be in that tribal mentality. So thankfully now, because of you know people like um, the elders in the LGBT community who have made it possible for people like me even to start uh, this thing in my community, because 10 years ago, I don't think I would have been able to start it. Um, so these discussions are happening, and they're happening even in places that you wouldn't think, to, uh, I mean, Iran, um, Saudi Arabia. I know some transgender youth who are starting their own underground discussion forums in such environments, and they reach out to us here. So we need to have this um, group efforts because you know, I am one man who started this group, and very difficult. I think the number of one of our committee members was saying, since the last three and a half years ago, we had 1,800, 1,800 youth who have come across to Marhala with zero funding, zero funding. So um, we can't continue it like that. But thankfully now change is happening and we need to have that shared responsibility. Because remember, with every privilege comes a great sense of responsibility. And if you look in Sydney, you will find youth who have been traumatized and uh, affected by their communities of faith and their families. So all you have to do is just look here and you can save lives. Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about the role of the law in, in protecting its sex people in Australia. And um, you know, people have been talking in Australia about this uh, five-letter acronym, LGBTI, for about six years, possibly longer. Uh, and in many ways, th this is um, a rhetorical shift um, that marks out Australian discourse on LGBT issues from similar discourse in the US or the UK. Um, it's often no more of a marker, no more than a marker of our locality, uh, because discourse on intersex issues, intersex inclusion, is still in its infancy, uh, and this means, from my perspective, that um, there is a bit of a rhetoric of intersex inclusion that doesn't match the reality, uh, and this causes a lot of harm. So, what I'm going to do is illustrate some of the contradictions and harms, in the hope that this can help us to tackle those issues better. Um, so what do I mean by the contradictions and harm? Well, if you look at legal discourse on intersex, then intersex can be simultaneously framed uh, as a gender identity, as a gender, as a sex, and as deriving legitimacy in international law from where UN conventions mention other status. There, there is no consistency in how people understand what intersex is. Um, in terms of federal anti-discrimination legislation, we are protected on grounds of intersex status, but that is usually in discourse reduced to gender 
And so following the, the passing of the legislation, an Australian legal journal described that key issues as honorifics, pronouns, and toilets. Um, but laws and policies to include and protect intersex people need to reflect how we understand ourselves, our diversity, and acknowledging that what can be a not so neat relationship between biological characteristics and legal sex assignment, and then between legal sex assignment and gender identity. But we're fortunate to have some good research in this country on people born with atypical sex characteristics. And it shows that rather than being a third sex, who all want to be called mix, somebody or other, and use unisex toilets, 52% of us are female, 23% of us are male, uh, and perhaps 19, 20% of people will seek to use uh, an X or, or other kinds of sex markers. At the same time, half of us in, in this survey are heterosexual, uh, and, and we use different kinds of language to describe our bodies. So if you want to include intersex people in, in, in policy, in, in a legal framework, you have to acknowledge that intersex people uh, include intersex women, intersex men, uh, and non-binary people. People who say they, they are not intersex, but they maybe have an intersex trait or variation, or they might use a diagnostic label, or even some more medicalized label. And so there are different ways of looking at intersex. And it's not clear always that people who talk about intersex as a sex or as a gender are even aware that intersex is simultaneously medicalized as disorders. And I know that IVF is not a human rights issue, um, but it offers a very stark example of this, of this uh, dichotomy between thinking of intersex as sex and thinking of intersex as a disorder. Um, because a lot of people do assume that, that you know, sex selection through IVF is unlawful in this country, and it generally is. But this prohibition doesn't protect embryos with intersex traits because medicine constructs intersex traits as disorders of sex development or abnormalities or serious genetic conditions. And this is actually a really significant point because if we ask most people how they feel about genetic selection on grounds of sex, then people are, to answer very, people are likely to answer very differently to how you would answer a question about selection on grounds of serious genetic conditions. It has a very different meaning. So medical and legal constructs have very significant consequences for how families and individuals understand what intersex is. And the legal system is well aware of this medicalization of intersex. Legislative and medical conceptions of intersex are simultaneously pushing in very radically different directions. On the one hand, intersex bodies are medically normalized. Our bodies made to fit stereotypical norms for females or males. And on the other hand, particularly legally, we are othered as a third sex. And the state is complicit in this. At times it doesn't feel like the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, but actually this is, this is often not the case. There, there is complicity. And some examples here. Um, my oldest example is from 1979, a family court case, uh, where the marriage, the heterosexual marriage, of course, of an Australian man um, was annulled on the basis that even though he'd been born and raised male, um, he was clinically a hermaphrodite. He'd undergone medical interventions to reinforce his assigned sex, and there's no evidence that he identifies as anything other than male. And indeed, a political identity as intersex or hermaphrodite was not available in 1970. It's still barely available now. But his marriage was annulled on the basis that he was a combination of man and woman. And so a marriage in this true sense could not have taken place. So his, his, his identity, his lifelong legal status, and his surgical normalization history were disregarded. Um, the judge in this case, it's an old case, but just, the judge in this case, Justice Graham Bell, only retired two years ago. So there's a very strong, close relationship between what happens then and what happens now. Um, some other examples, um, a couple of non-legal examples. Currently, the Victorian government says online that it values and celebrates diversity, but including sexualities, gender identities, intersex variations. 
At the same time, another part of the same website says that ambiguous genitalia, ambiguous genitalia can be a source of great distress for parents, delivery room, and nursery staff. And corrective surgery is usually undertaken in the first year of life. A minister in ACT has told me that a third sex marker will reduce the likelihood that parents will subject intersex children to such gender assignment surgery. At the same time, in another letter, she told me that children uh, with disorders are treated in line with the national approach and maybe normally referred to either Melbourne or Sydney for surgery. So the state is complicit in surgery at the same time as saying that, that, that a third sex mark, but a form of othering, can, can, can maybe um, save them from that process. Um, it's rare for actual cases to become public. I know quite a lot myself in private from talking with parents, with clinicians, and adults. Um, but conflicting messages, like what I've described from ACT in Victoria, create quite serious epistemic issues about comprehension, about understanding, about knowing what's going on. Um, and it's been quite difficult, I think, for the views of intersex advocates to be taken seriously and be heard and trusted. Um, but sometimes cases do become public. And one year ago, um, the family court case of Reed Carla saw a five-year-old with an intersex trait described as having a, a sexual development disorder. The judge in the case permitted parents to authorize a sterilization on the basis of what is an oft-claimed risk of cancer in her testes. The clinical evidence produced to the court does not substantiate that decision, does not support sterilization. And, but the judge relied heavily on gender stereotyping to support that sterilization. And the judge described her hair braids, her pink curtains, her mini mouse underwear, and even how she urinates to support that. The judge also noted as an incidental factor that two years before, which would be around three years ago now, the five-year-old had a clitorectomy and a labioplasty, but in the words of the judge, had enhanced the appearance of her female genitalia. That did not require court oversight. Um, the judge also said that, that um, future surgery might be required to prepare her body for heterosexual injury. So these cosmetic surgeries are facilitated by constructing intersex bodies as disordered and enhancements as therapeutic. The UN terms these as harmful practices. And on intersex girls in Australia, they are facilitated in part by an explicit exemption in prohibitions of female genital mutilation. So what can the law do? It can end these policy disjunctions. It can end these legal disjunctions. The law can prohibit what the UN calls harmful practices, or we might call less euphemistically gentle mutilation. It can outlaw, it can prohibit medical interventions designed to enhance children's bodies and make them more typically male or female, unless they choose to do that themselves. The law can require personal informed consent. The law can require effective rights-based oversight mechanisms to define policies on modifications to sex characteristics of children, to define policies on, on what can happen, to authorize necessary medical treatment and distinguish those from treatments based upon stigma and prejudice. The law can provide redress. It can ensure people have access to pediatric medical records. It can end genetic discrimination and ensure our respect to bodily integrity, physical autonomy, and self-determination. There's a lot to do, uh, and there's much more I can say, so I hope you'll ask some questions. And thank you for listening, and I hope you'll be back to our and present. Um, that was a wonderful welcome to country. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our LGBTI elders and congratulate 
everyone in the room for coming here today. It's part of the Mardi Gras program. There's lots of great parties in the program. So if you've taken um, this particular straw and, uh, take, and uh, taken the opportunity to learn about legal protection of rights. Um, so I'm very proud of all of you. Um, but also have a fabulous weekend. Um, <laughs> so where are we in terms of the journey towards equality for LGBTI people in Australia? And I think anyone, and as you've heard already, um, would have to be living under a rock if they didn't appreciate that we've had a huge wave of social and legal reform in this space uh, over the past five years. I mean, I, I feel very really lucky to have been working in this area um, over the past few years, and I think it's been described a number of times as I think the civil rights or human rights issue of, of our time, of this time. So it's a, it's a very exciting place to be in. Uh, despite this progress, um, what's really important to realise about LGBTI people is that unlike other vulnerable groups in Australia, we still have discrimination entrenched in the law. Our relationships aren't equal, they're not recognised everywhere in this country. Um, our families aren't always recognised and in some cases our very identities and as Morgan has described, our bodies. So we have a lot of catching up to do and um, despite the welcome reforms in 2013, we still have sprinkled across state laws and territory laws discrimination against LGBTI people. And that discrimination in the law actually causes the health impacts that have been alluded to earlier as well. So we need to, as a first step, um, make sure that every last stain of discrimination is removed from the statute books. Um, thankfully, that is happening. So following uh, the passage of the federal discrimination reforms in 2013, that has actually spurred a number of states to take action and tidy up uh, discriminatory laws that deal with adoption, that deal with family formation, um, uh, that deal with, for instance, the so-called gay panic defence or homosexual defence, partial defence to murder. Uh, so we've seen some really welcome steps taken by a number of state and territory governments over the past year. And we've actually seen Australia take some world first steps. Uh, in Victoria last year, we had a, an apology to victims of unjust uh, laws of the past that criminalised homosexuality. This was the first time in the world anything like this had been done. And I was privileged enough to sit with the Premier Daniel Andrews while he spoke to my clients, all men with convictions, and he heard from them firsthand about how the law used to turn thousands of ordinary young men into criminals. And it was a privilege to sit with those men in Parliament when the Premier apologised to each and every one of them and promised to do better in the future. Now that moment in Victoria was, I think, a really profound one of healing um, for, for the LGBTI community and for the Victorian government and society more broadly. And it's been really fantastic to see that in South Australia, Premier Jay Weatherall has taken a similar step just towards the end of last year and hopefully um, it's not, it's, it doesn't change the law, but those sorts of important statements on behalf of the state um, have an incredibly profound symbolic impact and, re and a reparative effect. Uh, what, once we've removed, and we're still on the journey obviously, but once we've removed discrimination in the law, um, obviously the next step is to address other rights and issues faced by LGBTI people. And I would recommend the uh, Commission's Resilient Individuals Report for a really good broad brush overview of um, the sorts of issues faced by LGBTIQ people in Australia. That said, there's been some good progress since the report's been out, which is fantastic. So. Um, it does need a bit of updating for next time around. Um, but what, what we're seeing is, for instance, moves to allow trans, um, gender diverse and intersex people access to birth certificates and identity documents that, that they need to be treated with dignity and respect. So um, my colleague Lee, um, who's down here in the front row tweeting madly, and I were in South Australia with 
also Chris Parker, who's at the back. Um, I acknowledge there's lots of other activists in the room that are doing lots of great things. Um, we were in South Australia last year when the parliament passed laws to allow um, trans people um, access to birth certificates without surgery. And um, when um, the, the, a young trans man um, that we got to know throughout the course of the debate on the bill, um, Ethan, um, for instance, he's 17, year, 17 years old, um, he should be worrying about um, getting his driver's license, passing, the, passing year 12, but instead he has to worry about the fact that everywhere he goes, he has um, documents that don't reflect how he lives and how he presents. And so we want kids like Ethan and trans people everywhere to be able to have access to, to documentation that simply reflects how they live and who they are. And that will um, have, have a really important and profound individual and psychological benefit for that person, but also in the day-to-day -day practical difficulties and the discrimination and stigma they face as a result of those, do those, do those lack of access to documentation. Um, there's also the issues faced by trans young people in accessing um, critical hormone treatment. At, at the moment we have this strange conundrum where trans young people desperately seeking um, hormones to allow them to live as the gender of, as they identify are faced with the barrier of the family court process. But you've already heard from Morgan that intersex um, infants and children are being subjected to surgeries without court authorisation. So we have this ridiculous situation in Australia where the groups that don't want or need oversight, where parents and doctors and children all agree on the same outcome, aren't accessing the treatment they need without the barriers presented by the court process. Yet intersex children are being, um, have been subjected to medical interventions without appropriate oversight. So something needs to happen there. And the good news is that the Federal Attorney General, George Brandis, is looking closely at this issue and has already um, said publicly in February last year that his, um, his department is preparing some advice and some solutions to address these issues. Um, but then um, I think what is interesting about where our movement is up to is that if you look at places like Victoria where there's a lot of work happening not just on the law but on the community, um, you know, what's next? So once we remove discrimination from the law, how do we affect social, the social change we need to reduce the stigma, to reduce the shame, the, the poorer social socioeconomic outcomes for trans people, for example, which is so significantly worse than other other minority groups in Australia. And and that's where um, I think it's important to think about um, changing the way we talk about LGBTI equality and moving um, from um, what could be described as um, uh, a discourse around the victimhood to the positive um, affirmation and celebration of LGBTI people, their identities and our communities. Um, and that's where I'm really impressed, um, probably because I'm seeing more of it. I'm sure there's really good things happening in New South Wales as well. Um, but in Victoria, there's, uh, we now have a Minister for Equality, a Commissioner for Gender and Sexuality, an LGBTI task force, a branch in this part of government, the Equality, the equality Branch, that is driving reform, the sorts of programmatic reforms um, capacity building in the community, um, building a pride centre, all of that important work. It's not legal work, but it's really critical to improving the lives of LGBTI people and realising their human rights on the ground. Uh, the next stage, I think, and the, the second reflection about where to next for our communities is really unpacking, I think, the diversity within the diversity of the LGBTIQ um, alphabet soup. And Noah's already touched on this um, and explained very articulately and, and with great personal impact the um, intersections between faith and sexuality and the sorts of issues that are presented for young people in particular in Australia today. But we also need to explore other intersectionalities, disability, indigeneity, um, and then delve into, as Morgan's already um, explained to you all, each and every cohort in that umbrella. So as a queer woman, my interests and needs are entirely different to an intersex man. 
and there's no reason why we need to keep being lumped together all the time as though we have similar or identical needs. Uh, the needs of bisexual people need to ex be explored and the, the difficulties they face within the LGBTIQ community, if you think of it in that broader sense, because um, they're so often subject to you know, booing, for instance, in the Pride March, sadly, in Victoria, for example, because they're seen as you know, not having a legitimate sexuality and sitting on the fence and all of those um, stereotypes that we've all heard too often. Um, and we know that bisexual women, for example, face much higher rates of mental illness than many of the other cohorts. So we do need to unpack that a little more. So what I'm really looking forward to um, in the future is starting to give every population group and every community under the umbrella of, our, of LGBTIQ um, some more attention and the I guess the unpacking that is needed to actually address all of their needs. Of course, um, I don't want to finish on a downer, but we do have our challenges, and progress doesn't come um, without setbacks. I think we all, we obviously all witness the um, unprecedented and now sustained attacks on the Safe School program last year, and that was really a warm up, I think, um, to what would have been you know, a really uh, ugly and hate-fueled um, debate around the plebiscite. Of course, we were determined to make sure that that plebiscite debate and the discussion, the national discussion, is going to be led by the LGBTI community in a respectful and positive way. But of course, there were fears, and I think legitimate fears, about um, the sorts of um, speech and um, and the sorts of messages that our communities would be on the receiving end of. Thank thankfully, we don't have the plebiscite to deal with anymore, and we, I'm sure we'll deal with marriage equality later, so I'm not going to address it now, um, because we talk about it a lot. Um, but let's, let's touch on briefly the fact that what I, one thing I want to touch on is the campaign against marriage equality. So the campaign um, by um, the conservative Christian voices that are not representative of Australian Christians, their attacks on the Safe Schools program, their attacks on transgender young people are really part of, a, of their fight against marriage equality. So I feel like the victims of the marriage equality um, debate don't really have a voice in the debate. Um, and that's one thing that perhaps we can unpack in discussion, which is I think more than ever we need a sophisticated and um, better developed understanding of um, how to build greater awareness of tr the existence and the needs of trans people and trans young people in Australia. I think it's actually quite critical. Um, so the, the Safe Schools Coalition attacks, um, the debate around the plebiscite, and um, you may not be aware that, that, that a bill in Victoria, two bills in Victoria failed last year by one vote each um, because the coalition um, decided to vote against um, LGBTI reforms that traditionally they would have a conscience vote on. And I think the coalition um, unfortunately did that because they were convinced that there was, there was some political benefit in sort of beating up on LGBTI people, beating up on trans young people and um, the Safe Schools program more broadly. And that is a very sad state of affairs. And all the good work that was done, um, for instance, the, the 2013 discrimination reforms um, that were passed with bipartisan support from a Tony Abbott-led coalition opposition um, that introduced intersex and gender identity um, legal protections back in 2013. I think um, that was you know, a high watermark of public support and bipartisanship around LGBTI issues, which has sadly um, fallen away. And I think we need to be conscious of that and we need to rebuild um, political support for our issues and be, um, I think, cleverer about the way we approach our advocacy. So I'll just end by saying, uh, I think um, some of these challenges are a, a pretty sober reminder of how fragile some of our gains are and that um, obviously, he hasn't come up yet, but obviously in a, in a Trump, post-Trump um, world, 
um, there's greater uncertainty about many of the institutions and values that we used to um, hold as um, cherished and as natural part, naturally part of Australian life. But I think we can take heart uh, from the fact that these forces that work against us will also um, bring us all together and can really galvanise us um, for the journey and the battle ahead. So um, let's all work together and I'm sure that in a few years' time we'll be confident in saying that LGBTI people in Australia can be, um, can be confident that they are treated with respect and they can feel safe and they don't suffer simply because of who they are or who they love. And that's the goal that we all should be working towards. Thanks very much. Now I'm going to move to the whole mic. Um, I hope everyone can still hear me. Uh, thank you very much, all three of the speakers. Um, Anna's left us with a really great jumping off point um, in referring to the bipartisanship um, that marked the reforms in 2013, introducing protections against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status. The question for any or all of the panel members is, what do you think is some of the practical impact um, that uh, that law reform has had on the lives of LGBTIQ people in Australia? Better? Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, uh, in the work that Lee and I do in, at the Human Rights Law Centre on LGBTI rights issues, we obviously come up against um, this sort of work all the time. So every day we speak to people from the LGBTI communities, our partners in, um, in community organisations whose, whose members, whose clients, are facing discrimination, are facing barriers to service delivery. And having the law protect those people from discriminatory treatment is incredibly important. And it's not it's not that it, it's not that complaints will necessarily be made or that legal action will be um, taken because we all know that that's incredibly resource resource intensive and for someone who's suffering discrimination, you don't often have the emotional resources to do this sort of thing. But just knowing that the law is on their side makes an incredible difference. It's very empowering. It means that you can go to the negotiating table with your employer, um, confident that you've got the law on your side. And I can see the change in the corporate sector um, through you know programs like Pride and Diversity, and corporates getting on board with you know what the law says and the protections it gives for LGBTI people. So I think it's had an incredibly beneficial and practical impact. Um, we, we probably don't see lots of court cases, but it doesn't mean it's not working its way into um, the way people go about their daily lives. Of course, we do need to do more education, so you guys should get lots of money and go out and make sure that LGBTI people know what their rights are, because I see that as a big gap as well. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. I think... Um, the 2013 legislation had a, a huge symbolic value. Uh, it's really important. Um, I think a lot more people have heard the word intersex as a result. Uh, a lot more people born with intersex variations are, are aware that there is some form of protection. And we know that intersex people, we, we do face discrimination in education, uh, in employment, in, in many other fields. But there are some exemptions in the Act. Uh, there's not a big religious, religious exemption. But there is an exemption in sport, which means that um, uh, women with intersex variations may, under some circumstances, face exclusion uh, uh, under the law, even though since the law was passed, we know that there's no um, real evidence to support the assertion that women with intersex variations have any advantage. Um, but for me, I mean, the, the, um, the difficulty I have is when I look at cases like Reed Carla in the family court just last year, um, and the um, the way in which legislation on intersex status and anti-discrimination legislation has had no impact whatsoever on how the court does its work. 
um, you know, the, um, there is an exclusion in, in federal policy, uh, in national policy frameworks around FGM. Um, there's an exemption that permits um, medical interventions on people whose genitals are, are, are ambivalent, which is a very ambivalent way of phrasing the term, um, which enables medical interventions to happen on intersex girls. But I don't think the people that have framed this maybe realize or believe that medical interventions can happen without the consent of the individual concerned. Um, but, um, you know, there, there are some conflicts that, in terms of how, how these issues interrelate that just don't work for me. Uh, and so the law reform was really helpful, symbolic, but in practice, what has it actually meant? It's much more uncertain. Matt, this is a question for you, Imam Noor. Um, you've spoken very powerfully of what it can be like to be um, both the LGBTI from that community, the LGBTI community, and also be from the Muslim community. And, and perhaps if you add to that a third dimension being young. Um, one of the dangers, as, as I disclosed, I'm a lawyer, but the dangers particularly of lawyers and people who wield hammers is we think that there's always one particular solution. So lawyers tend to see a legal solution. People wielding hammers tend to see every problem as a nail. Do you, do you see the law as something that is going to be particularly helpful for your community? Or do you see the change for you being somewhere outside the law, somewhere more about society or cultural? Do you think it's an interaction between the two? I think if we um, if we had the marriage equality, and if we had the safe schools, um, then the law would have been effective for the Muslim community. And we have a lot of young people who reach out to a girl that I gave the example, and, um, about the 16-year-old, was in an Islamic school. They have um, certain protections that make them um, different to other public schools, and that is a issue that I have um, with our government and our uh, lawmakers because there are a large number of LGBTIQ plus Muslim kids in those schools. And that girl, the 16 year old, um, uh, she was fortunate because she had a school psychologist at this Islamic school who was a non-Muslim who somehow found out that she was really suffering at home and in the school. So I remember last year we had, I met with the, um, the uh, Commission Against Child Abuse. They came from Sydney to visit me in Melbourne. And one of the things that I found with them, and it comes back to what you were saying, Anna, about education, that they actually have the powers to go into these schools. The only organization that I know of that has that power to and even spread pamphlets that they were educated. Um, and it's a very difficult environment, but it's at least a step, a step forward. So um, I'm optimistic with where the law is going, but you know, from an Islamic community perspective, I think uh, a lot of youth are left behind. Thank you. Ask one more question, and then i to turn it open to the audience to, to ask questions as well. Um, and I wanted to pick up on something that you said before. You, you, you said, I think, every, won't rest essentially until every last stain of discrimination um, is removed from the statute book. Uh, I think that's a very powerful and succinct way of putting it. Um, but any of the panel members to tell us a little bit about what you've seen of the effects of those stains of discrimination because I think we're right to celebrate um, the progress that we've made, um, but a theme, I guess, of um, each of your speeches has been that there's an enormous amount of work still to do and there's only going to be an impetus for that work if we truly understand the nature of the problem and what's its practical effect. Um, does anyone want to jump in on, on that question? I'm getting nods. Um, well, I mean, I talked a bit about this earlier, but I think day to day, um, 
I mean, there's so much attention on marriage equality, and we should talk about marriage at some point, but um, there's very little awareness that there's discriminatory aspects of state laws that affect LGBTI people in day to day life in their day to day lives in practical ways that often they work around, but it's mainly to do with their um, families and their relationships. And people might remember the um, really tragic case of Marco and David Bulwurzi in South Australia last year, the couple from the UK that were married, that went to South Australia for their honeymoon. And when one of the men um, tragically died on their honeymoon, uh, the funeral director did not recognise um, the surviving husband as, as the next of kin. Um, now, speaking of the law, the law in South Australia actually dictated that he should be recognised as the next of kin, but I think this is what inequality does. It um, sort of affects the way people think about LGBTI people. So um, the funeral director talked to the father, the death certificate was issued and um, um, never married was used as the description or unmarried from memory. Now that that case study or that, you know, that tragic situation had such a, a personal impact on the Premier, I think, that it really was a powerful catalyst to um, spearhead the reform that we saw in South Australia last year, which was four bills and in as many weeks um, be considered by their parliament. And they picked out, so relationship recognition was one thing. So in their day-to-day -day lives, South Australian same-sex couples just couldn't be recognised easily and immediately. And often when it's going to hospital or you know the worst of times in your life, when you just need um, a service provider not to be questioning um, that you're the loved one of the person that's on the operating table is when these sorts of situations happen. So um, those are the sorts of impacts people face. And, you know, people raising kids um, who just want to be sure that the teacher at the school is going to accept that they're the one that can say that it's okay to administer a Panadol. So um, families work around it, couples work around it, um, but Every day, um, there's lots of people out there that don't have sort of the certainty of legal recognition, and that's what we need to address. Thank you. Um, I might now open uh, up to questions from the audience. I might stand here so I can see you, and you can see me perhaps more easily. Uh, so we've got a couple of rubbing mics, and because we're operating hearing them, please wait until the microphone comes. So we've got a question in the third row there. Um, we might uh, take a couple of questions at a time. Um, so. Hello, my name is Janet Berry. I'm actually down here from Queensland where I'm with an organisation that supports uh, LGBTIQ plus students in schools. Thank you very much for some very interesting talks. There are lots of questions I would like to ask you, but I'm going to stick to one. Um, there are so many differences in the way LGBTIQ plus young people and adults are cared for and treated among the different states and territories. So many differences. Uh, so I found myself saying last week to the education department that the safety of young people actually depends on the state in which they're brought up and where they go to school. Have you got any thoughts on um, how to uh, make things more equal across the states and territories for our LGBTIQ people, especially youth? Thank you. Excellent question. And before you have at it, I've got one more question to Rosa. Yes. My name is uh, Mark Gillespie. I'm a 78er, um, attacked in um, June 1978 by the police in this state. And just a quick question, I have to say from my heart how I respect the work that Imam uh, Noor is doing in, in Melbourne. Uh, I can't express that strongly enough uh, when I think back to my own life. Um, but just back to your an earlier question, and a follow-up question. If homosexuality was not decriminalized by law in this state in 1984, attitudes to us as a minority group would never have changed. So the basic question about law and law being used as a tool to achieve human rights, you know, it's fundamental. And when it comes to religion and the role that established religion plays in our oppression still within the family it's often the the the, the
reason given for our uh, ostracism from the family, um, the religious beliefs. So this this role of institutionalized religion, let's not pick on Islam. Let's not just pick on Islam for God's sake. Let's pick on the other religions as well. Why isn't the law changing now to bring to boot, to bring to heal? Sorry, I'm getting a little bit um, emotional. But why aren't we, why isn't the Human Rights Commission, uh, why aren't those of you working in this area seeking to control the way that the churches, the religions in Australia still discriminate against us? Thank you for both of those questions. So the first question was about, I guess, the harmonisation of the law around Australia. Um, the LGBTQ and the second question is clearly about the link between religion. Um, so first question, um, very well put, we're, that's what we're working on and um, we're getting there. I think Queensland has um, passed some fantastic reforms last year and is still working away at those. Um, but I think, yeah, you're spot on and we need to address that. But unfortunately because of our federal system it has to be a state by state and territory by territory process. And then of course the in Commonwealth law, um, it's the Marriage Act that we need to change, obviously. Uh, the second, just a couple of comments on the second question. Um, at the Human Rights Law Centre, um, we obviously support the rights, um, all human rights, including um, the right of freedom of religion. Uh, we are doing work around the intersection between some of the sort of the harms caused by religion, um, not all religious practice, obviously, but some aspects and um, the needs and psychological well-being of the LGBTI community. We're doing a project around um, gay um, conversion, or so-called conversion therapy, and looking at legal and regulatory responses to that problem. We're partnering with Gay and Lesbian Health Victoria, and we're, it, you know, it's a very small grant, but we're trying to, um, we've interviewed um, subjects from across, in, you know, almost every jurisdiction, jurisdiction in Australia. Unfortunately, um, it seems that Gay conversion therapy is alive and well in Australia. It's more underground, so it's difficult to identify and regulate. Um, but there's no question that we need to address it. So um, that's something we are working on at the moment. And if we do get to the um, to talking about marriage equality, I think it, we can also have a discussion about religious freedom there. But I don't think the two uh, we shouldn't be talking about God versus gay. Um, it's the wrong prism to be looking at this in. We, I mean, if you look at the issue of marriage equality, we have a majority of support, I think, in, the, in every faith group on that issue. And um, there is a consensus and a space for um, inclusion and respect for diversity of LGBTI people and religious belief and practice. And that, that space, and you know, that's exactly where NUA is working in. Um, that's what we need to expand, we need to grow and we need to really um, make sure that LGBTI people are protected, but also um, that their faith is respected as well. Um, thank you very much for your question. And, um, you know, I almost got here when you mentioned um, your journey here in Sydney. Um, one of the um, uh, challenges, I think, in the Muslim tradition as an imam, uh, before the challenge is one of the positive things, there's no church authority that can excommunicate me. So once you're an imam and once you're a hafiz, it's a title that is yours. Um, the church and a friend of mine who is a minister in Melbourne, he was at risk of being excommunicated when he was he went through divorce. He divorced his wife and then remarried a long time and um, he said that the church almost kicked me out. Um, we don't have that. Uh, but the thuggery still exists within the religious leadership because the minute you go against the, um, the, the status quo of the imam position, you lose all um, you know, accessibility even to mosques, um, let alone houses. And the group that um, Imams and board of imams of different states have, even on households, Muslim households, is quite shocking. 
Now, this was one of the consequences I thought of when I started with Mahalab. And I was always privileged, thankfully, that I was not answerable to any uh, board of imams. I was always the youngest, I was always on a gay one, but they didn't know that. Um, but, you know, they res we respected each other. There was this somewhat of a mutual dislike to each other. Um, because I was always age appropriate to the youth and related to them. And um, I had the theological um, backing as well. Um, so one of the things I am doing now, as I said, to, as a consequence of starting Mahaba, and one of the things that I thought of as one of the worst case scenarios, was losing um, my natural habitat, which is a mosque. Um, and a lot of youth suffer from that. Uh, and that's something I wasn't willing to do. I was willing to lose my natural habitat, but I wasn't willing to accept um, like one of our members, a lesbian girl, went to a mosque on a Friday, and because of her appearance, she went to the women's section, and an elderly um, woman threw a scarf at her and said, dress properly or go home. That was a young um, girl. That was something I wasn't willing to accept. Um, so what I am doing is I'm providing a, an alternative. I hope when I started this group three and a half years ago, and we just recently, to correct what I said, that we didn't have no funding, October last year, we just received a little bit of funding from the government. Just a little bit, not much. And it's one to two year type of funding, and these problems are not going to go away in one to two years. So I am hoping to establish a, a drop-in center for these youth who have been ostracized, marginalized, and rejected from mosques, um, were a place that they can call it the spiritual healing center, not necessarily a mosque. And a place which would also have a mediation facility. And my vision is to have that in um, every state, at least in Australia, in my lifetime, because we have members in every state. Um, and also a safe house, because the transition for a lot of LGBT youth who come from any religious background is difficult if they're always in that environment that is causing the trauma. So how can they keep connection with the family but at the same time transition safely? Hence we are I'm working towards the state house as well. Can I greet you quick? <laughs> I just wanted to give a special mention to Francis Boone who's in the audience. I just noticed him. He's the faith outreach coordinator for the equality campaign. So if you want sort of a source of optimism about all that all that's good that's happening in faith-based communities and religious communities to support the movement for equality, have a chat to Francis and hopefully um, he'll give you some reason to feel more positive. And that, uh, Francis brought together a fantastic collection of faith leaders um, in Parliament House in Canberra at the end of last year, which gave that diversity of perspectives on um, religion, which, which puts a lie to uh, what Anna described as the, the idea of this. See this is a rubric of God versus gay. Um, so, one or two last questions, um, if anyone wants to. One there. Hi, my name is Nancy Mills. I'm a lawyer by training. I'm also that to this very person, the parent of a transgender child. I'm. Um, he's 19 now. He's, we've been through the family court process. We've change the name of the birth certificate, we can't change the gender. There will be, I'm also, also, uh, working with Amnesty International at the moment and part of the LGBTQ, LGBTQI network. Um, and we have had discussions with members of state parliament about amending the Births, Deaths and Marriages Act to do away with the requirement of surgery before you can change your gender. Now, my experience with changing names and gender on all sorts of documents has been, if you're just dealing with an administrative practice in the Commonwealth government, it's pretty easy. There's no drama. If you want to change your name and gender on your local birth certificate, you just, or the driver's license, you just need a letter from the doctor. And even, okay, mom was there as well, so I'm not sure it would have been quite as smooth with him if he'd gone on his own, but, Simply, you know, when we changed the gender on his driver's license, he pulled out the, the red peas which, from his wallet, which had the curve in it from him sitting on it for a year. 
And the woman said, the clerk says, oh, all the boys have licenses like that. And he said, yes, well, on that point, check the records. We'd like to change the female to male now, and here's the letter. And it has happened. All that is easy. But when you get to the point of changing the Family Law Act to get rid of that ridiculous requirement of court approval for stage two treatment, or amending the Birth, Death, and Marriage Act to do away with surgery, as soon as you've got to get something through Parliament these days, problems arise. Have you got any advice from your Victorian experience with any approaches we might be wanting to take in New South Wales? Because I can see problems arising. And before you start answering that question, we're really tight on time. So you could speak for hours about this. Yeah, um, because there's things underway. Morgan's been involved in this already, I know, and Alex Greenwich MP yes. has conducted a consultation yes. process. Um, we have a new Attorney General in New South Wales, so I think there's a new opportunity for progress in this area. So certainly it's something that Lee and I at the Human Rights Law Centre are committed to working on with people like Morgan and transgender communities, parents of transgender kids in New South Wales. So very happy to have a chat afterwards and we can work out a good strategy for getting it done. I can't add much to that really. Um, I will note that it does affect some intersex people as well. We know that um, a sizable number of intersex people do uh, change um, sex classification. Uh, and I know that people have issues with um, uh, the, the marriage um, part of that legislation. You know, people have to be unmarried to change their, their ID uh, in this state. Um, uh, and there are other issues as well. Um, I mean, I hope that marriage reform will, will help to deal with that problem, but, but other states and territories have, have begun to address that issue independently of what happens at federal level. On that note, I think we're out of time, um, but uh, you may, if you've got some remaining questions, um, uh, the, the panel members may well have a few minutes um, after the formal part to answer your questions. Uh, I finally would like to um, thank all three of our panellists once again on behalf of everyone here for speaking so powerfully from their experience but also giving us such a balanced sense both of how far we've come and how far we still have to go. So I encourage everyone to give them a warm round of applause. We were so pleased to have all of you join us in our home, so to speak. Sometimes it's a vision running season and that seems all too literal. Um, we, we, as I said at the start, are honoured to be part of this Mardi Gras season and to um, facilitate such excellent speakers uh, to give their perspectives on these issues. And uh, more generally, we the Commission take LGBTI human rights issues very, very seriously, and we encourage you to continue um, to liaise with us on the issues that are of greatest importance to you. Thank you very much.